Hey College Side. What's going on family? We sure do miss you all. We miss seeing your faces. We miss hearing your voices. And I know I can speak on behalf of the students and saying that they miss you too. And while we do miss you, one thing that gives us comfort is knowing that we are still united in the spirit. We are still united in love. And one verse, verses actually that bring us comfort in this time is in Romans 8 and it says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, not height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. No virus can separate us. No tornado can separate us. We miss you all dearly. We can't wait to see you. We love you. We love you. Hi, college side. I certainly do miss all of you. I'm ready to get back. I've got my candy ready, kids. I miss all of you so much. I miss your hugs. I miss your kisses. I miss your getting to see your Bible class pictures that you've made. I just miss being with you. It's been reminding me about heaven. It's going to be so wonderful when we get to heaven and we'll be together all the time. I love you all so much. Bye-bye. Good morning and welcome to College Side. We're so thankful that you chose to join us for our online assembly this morning. And we're thankful for you if you're a member at College Side as part of our church family, or if you are joining us from all across the country as we continue to hear, there's so many that we've been able to connect with. Isn't it great what God has done through technology to allow us to connect, especially at a time like this? During times like this, we are anticipating and looking so much forward to the time we can get back together as a family. Uh, but I want to thank you on behalf of the, the church leadership, our elders, our ministry team. I want to thank you for all you're doing to connect with one another in the body of Christ. Uh, there have been so many folks that have reached out across our church family uh, to encourage uh, we have continued to see our church family give financially during this time. And I continue to hear of people that, that tell me how encouraged they are that, that there is intentionality. Uh, truly doing our best to be a family at a time where it's difficult. There's a lot of obstacles. So while we look forward to the time we can be together in the same room, and worship and praise God together and we know that is coming soon at this time I just want to say thank you for what you have done and what you continue to do we look forward to this morning's worship and our time of, of in the in the word and we just pray that you'll be encouraged you'll participate and let's all now worship God together Some trust in the chariots, we trust in the name of the Lord. Some trust in the horses, 
Trust in the 
church family, we want to take a moment now to remember um, Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us. I know this is something that we, we do each week. And as I start thinking about what I wanted to share this morning, I wonder what it would be like for the New Testament believers to go through the transition that they went through after persecution breaks out before the the normal for them was to meet together daily they were all together in jerusalem they shared things in common they were following jesus and they understood what it meant to follow jesus and then overnight things changed they drastically changed and so we find ourselves not in a time of persecution but in a time of change that's very drastic for me, I've been a part of a church family for as long as I can remember. And most every memory that I have of being a part of a church family is connected to a place, a location. And now it's all different. So in a world that's changing so quickly and things are, things are being disrupted that have never been disrupted before in our lifetime, it's nice to know that some things are still the same. When persecution breaks out and they scatter, they still do this ritual to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. And we're going to do that now. In our, in our homes, in our locations, we're going to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. So let's pray together. Father, we realize that you are over all things. And although we have a lot of questions, Lord, and there's a lot of uncertainty in the things going on around us. We know that there is a constant and that you are that constant. Father, we're thankful that you gave us the supper to take and to remember the body of Jesus and what it means to us and the sacrifice that was made for us. And I pray, Lord, as we take it and as we think about the sacrifice that he made, that you would help us to understand during this time what it means for us to sacrifice ourselves and our bodies and our lives to you as we try to follow you in our new circumstances that we find ourselves in. These things we pray through the name of Jesus. Amen. We also want to take this fruit of the vine that represents the blood of Jesus that was sacrificed for us. So let's pray together. Father, we realize that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And you knew, Lord, from very early on that we as flawed beings would need forgiveness 
So Lord, we thank you for the way that you made for us to receive that, for Jesus' willingness to sacrifice, and for his blood that washes away our sins. And so as we drink this, Father, I pray that we would just make a profound statement of faith from our homes. Lord, that we really do believe the things that we claim to believe. And that is we believe Jesus died and that he rose from the dead. Lord, please bless us as we drink this cup now. And these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I see the work of your hands, galaxies spin in the heavenly dance. Oh God, all that you are is so overwhelming. I hear the sound of your voice, all at once it's a gentle and thundering noise. Oh Well, I, first of all, I'd like to say good morning to my College Side family. Uh, it's a, a real blessing to be with you. Well, to sort of be with you. It's, you know what I mean. <laughs> and also, I'd like to say welcome to anyone that's uh, not a member of our College Side family. And for you to know that you are so welcome to be a part of our, our church family any, at any time you'd like to be. And we would love that. But we're just glad that you're watching with us this morning. Um, also, I'd like uh, to say uh, I'm, very, I'm very thankful uh, this morning for our uh, ministry staff and for uh, them uh, creating this meaningful worship time for you. Uh, that, that takes a lot of effort and a lot goes into it, and I'm just very thankful for, for them, and I just want, to, want you to be in the same way. Uh, I'd also like to say thank you for, to them for 
forming what's known as our care groups now, where we check on uh, each and every member of our church families. Someone should have or will be calling you soon, and that's an intentional thing that's been uh, devised and organized by our ministry staff, and we need to say thank you for that. Um, there's been uh, some discussion, uh, very little, but some discussion about when and exactly how we're going to return to a, a regular worship time. Uh, nothing has been really decided about that, but we're looking forward to that. And it is being discussed, and, and you'll be finding out details of, of when and how that will happen before too long. Uh, I also like to make known to you uh, that uh, College Side has been very blessed with uh, donations in the form of uh, uh, tornado relief or disaster relief. And if you have been affected or if your family has been affected or if you know of a family that's been affected, we'd like to encourage you to reach out to the College Side family. Give the office a call. If you can't get through to the office, uh, we're currently not there all the time. So if you can't get through to the office, uh, there is an online application form that you can fill out. If you can't uh, find your way through all of that, contact one of your shepherds or one of our shepherds. Um, we'd be more than happy to help you with anything we possibly can. Uh, we've been very blessed with that and we want to be a blessing to the people that are struggling right now. So I just encourage you to do that. Um, and uh, I'd like for us to pray now. Father, we uh, just come into your presence. First of all, just praising your holy name, thanking you, Father, for this beautiful day. So we sit here in the beauty of this, uh, your creation. Uh, there's a lot of turmoil in this world, but uh, Father, we know that you still sit on the throne, that you're still in, in control, and we just praise you and thank you for that. Father, we'd like to ask you to intervene in some way in this turmoil that we're facing. We don't know quite what to ask you to do, but we know that uh, you are in control of this world. And so, Father, we would ask you to intervene in whatever means uh, you need to intervene and for us to find a vaccination or some medication that will work, Father. We just know full well that you still are in control, Father, and we just ask you to bless us as you know best. Father, more than anything, we'd like to pray that uh, when we come out of this situation that we'd be in more devotion and dependence upon you. I pray that uh, you put on each one of our hearts at this time a desire to be more uh, devoted to you and to uh, use this time to learn more about what you want us to be, how you want us to, to uh, treat one another, and what you want us to commit ourselves to during this lifetime. I just pray that if there's anything that good comes out of this, that that will be what it will be, Father. Father, we ask uh, prayers especially for those who are still recovering from the tornadoes that uh, have been a part of uh, this area and the Chattanooga area for uh, all of those families that have been affected. Father, we ask for uh, your peace and comfort for each one of those families. We'd like to ask a very special prayer for those that are nearest and dearest to our hearts, for Matt Collins and, and Macy and, and Laney, Father. And uh, we just pray for your comfort to be upon them. For the Minettes, we thank you and praise you for the progress that Harper has made. And we ask you to continue to be with her. Bless her. Let her just be totally healed and complete and healthy. We pray a very special prayer for the farmers, uh, for the Suggs family for every family, Father. And in that, Father, we know that uh, th during this time that Satan is out there and he wants to steal, uh, kill, and destroy each one person that has been affected. And he has a way of getting into their hearts. We pray, Father, that those families, every family, will hold on to the faith that they have in you, Father, and that they will, uh, uh, in the end, will be made stronger and better because of their faith, Father. Just sustain them in any way you possibly can. We're so thankful for our ministry staff and for all that they have done for our church family. We just pray you continue to bless each one of them, help each one of them to uh, 
be the men and women that they need to be, Father, and to lead those ministries as they know best. Thank you for them. Father, we rejoice in the fact that we've had two additions to our, our church family in this past week uh, for Brad Brown and his uh, uh, baptism of his 91-year young great-aunt, Sue Sinachak. We just praise you for that. What an incredible blessing that is that a person 91 years old and still has uh, been willing to accept uh, Jesus as her Lord. Thank you for that. We thank you for Kenzie McClellan, and uh, we just uh, thank you for her commitment and for her baptism also. We just pray that you be with those two as they commit their life to you. One person we'd like to offer a very special prayer for, and that is Robert Gribble, uh, someone that's very near and dear to our hearts. And Father, we know that Robert has had surgery this past week, and uh, it was a very serious surgery, but he's doing well. We just thank you for that praise you for him and father for all that he means to to you father we just ask you to continue to be with he and susan and bless them in a very special way father again we just ask you to help us to accept the lessons that have been pre presented to us in this uh, past uh, couple of weeks uh, we thankful especially for your love we know that your love is uncondit unconditional and boundless and limitless and we just praise you and thank you for that Help us to receive that in a way that will be a blessing back to you. We thank you for your word, Father, and for the way that your word is so powerful to us. And we thank you for the way that our ministers are presenting that to, to this area, Father. And we just we continue to bless, ask blessings on each one of them. Father, we thank you for your plan. Uh, we know full well that your plan is the only plan that we need to go by. And Father, we know that all you want is our hearts. And so we just pray that we are willing to give up our hearts, turn them to you, and trust you with them. Father, we ask you and praise you to continue to be with us. Uh, bless us, Father. Help us to seek your will in all things and more than anything else. Father, we ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit. Let that Holy Spirit be our counselor, our teacher, our guide, our comforter, and our sustainer in this life, especially during this difficult time. We just want to praise you and thank you again, Father, and it's in the precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and so shall I be saved from my enemies. I know the Lord and blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord live up and blessed be the rock and let the God of my salvation be exalted. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and so shall Hey, welcome back. Thanks again for joining us uh, for our online worship assembly this week. I'm grateful um, and, and really, just let me say, blown away uh, by the reach of what we're doing. And I'm thankful that you're with us. Um, most of all, I'm thankful uh, that we are studying this book. My hope and prayer has been for all of us that Peter's words to the elect exiles 
uh, would would be relevant to us, but but more than that, that that those words would reveal to us what God's doing. Um, that He's doing something and that what He is doing is good and that we should worship Him because of what He's doing. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful uh, for you being with us. Before we start, let's uh, ask God to bless our time and then we will jump in back into chapter 1 of 1 Peter and we'll study. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for your word. Um, we're thankful for the power of your word. We're thankful for transformation and sanctification and holiness that comes because of your word. God, I pray that this morning you would speak to us. God, I pray that I would just get out of the way um, and that you would say to all of us what you want to say. I'm grateful for this opportunity and pray that you would use it to your glory and for our good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's four phrases that we have spent the last four weeks really kind of zeroing in on. And ultimately what, what Peter has done is he's built a theological case that in the next couple of weeks we're going to see serves as a foundation for living a life that counts for something in exile. Relationally and how we relate to our leaders in the world, all of that is built on sound theology. And these are the four phrases that we have talked about over the last several weeks. Elect exiles, you're still being chosen even though you're exiled, grace is being multiplied to you, bless God, for what you know and what you don't know. Rejoice in testing. Trust that God is helping you now endure and grow in the midst of a test and subsequent glories. The sufferings of Jesus Christ produce a landscape of God's good presence in your life right now and in the future. This is how Peter continues in the text. Pick up with me in the 13th verse. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Peter says, prepare your minds. Now that... that, that um, brings up an excellent question. Why would the elect exiles have to have minds that were prepared? Why the mind and why prepared? I think it's safe to say, as we alluded to a couple of weeks ago, that at some point or another, the situation that they found themselves in had changed. And they were feeling different about it and wondering about how they could carry on in faith despite what they saw around them, despite all of the persecution that was occurring, despite the increasing power that Rome was exhibiting in their circumstance, how do we relate? How do we deal with this? What's, what's going to happen? How can I live in faith, but also live in such a way where it doesn't cause an uproar all the time that isn't called for? Peter says, you've got to have minds that are prepared 
And what Peter's going to say in the rest of this letter, or at least a lot of this letter that we're going to start to unpack in a couple of weeks, would really set them up to demonstrate their faith in such a way where there would be no doubt of who they were following. There would be no doubt that their faith was the reason for their lifestyle. And so Peter says, before I tell you any of the practical, you've got to prepare your minds. You've got to think through what this could mean. Because if you're going to live the way that I'm going to tell you to live, the way ultimately that God is going to tell you to live, you've got to be ready in your mind for what you're going to face. And what's interesting, what's extraordinary, what's powerful about that is it's not so much of what they would have faced coming from the outside, but what they were going to face on the inside. You're going to have to have a certain level of commitment to live this way. You're going to have to have a certain level of obedience to live this way. You've got to prepare your mind. It's not going to happen. Think, pray, plan, prepare your mind and enter into this willingly. Be prepared when the change happens. Be prepared when challenges arise. Be prepared when you feel like Ultimately, Peter says a couple of things. This is the first thing that Peter says. Prepare your mind through hope. Maybe you say, John, John I, I want my mind to be prepared for whatever the future in our country, in our circumstance, in our world looks like. I want to be prepared so that when all of this ends, I take the growth that I have experienced over the last several months I take the interactions that I have with the Lord and I grow that even more in the future than in the past. So I want my mind to be prepared. How do I do that? Prepare your mind through hope. Look at what Peter says, verse 13 again. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of of Jesus Christ. Now, hope is very much like the word glory, which we talked about the last time we were together. Hope, even though we use that word maybe more than we use the word glory, hope is an incredibly difficult word to define theologically. Faith says, based on God's promises, this is true now. Hope, based on God's promises, says this will be true in the future. They're related, but they're slightly different. P faith says now, hope says future. Hope is desiring and expecting God's work and promise keeping in the future. Let me ask you a question. What is, um, what's your hope throughout the time of this exile? What do you hope happens? What results do you hope for? Now, the original audience, um, we, we have to approximate just a little bit, but probably their hope was likely for salvation from persecution or it was transformation in their thinking as they dealt with unusual, unforeseen circumstances. Some of their hope was probably vindication from the authorities and powers in the world that were mistreating people. I mean, picture in your mind's eye, picture that there would have been a believing Christian mother who would have lost a son or daughter, to persecution. What's her hope? What's her hope for the exile? They wanted vindication. 
They wanted deliverance. They wanted salvation from what they were feeling and what they were thinking. They wanted safety and security from unforeseen challenges in their time. What's your hope? Say it out loud. Speak it. Own it. What is your hope? Now here's the, here's the interesting thing about this text and this time that we are living in. There's a very strong temptation, I think, to do something like this. Um, l- l- let, me, let me approximate it this way. It's not the way that I would have it. Watch the news, read the newspaper, um, read social media. It's not the way that I want it. I feel challenged. I don't like it. So that feeling of things not being the way I wished they were can consume us to the point where we simply focus on what it's not rather than on what it can be. That's what Peter's saying. Set your hope. Change your mind. Prepare your mind through hope. It's easy to be consumed during crises like this with simply the way it's not. What we lost, what we don't have, the way we wish that it was, that it's not. But Peter said, no, 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 listen, hope. What can it be? according to God's good promises in the future. Set your hope, now follow me here, on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whatever your hope, whatever your hope for change is, however you wished the situation was, take it, Peter says, and set it on grace. Now, this is such a profound concept. Picture what Peter is saying. Whatever you hope for the future, based on God's promises, that it looks like, pick it up, take it, and set it on grace. It's it's a beautiful picture. What does that mean? What does that look like? And what what I want to show you this morning is that taking your hope and setting it on grace is an interrelated concept that will change how we view the days in which we live. Take your hope and set it on grace. Now here's what happens when you pick up your hope and you put it on the grace that will be brought at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Immediately, you will become increasingly aware of how blessed you are. When you hear the word grace, what do you see? I'm convinced the longer that I spend in church that the majority of the people, when they hear the word grace, they think the definition mercy. Grace is being given what you do not deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. And I'm just going to be real honest with you. We're really good at mercy and not so good at grace. I think Peter knows that. That's not just a problem for our time in the context of the 21st century church. That's been a problem throughout all time. We have a half-hearted definition of grace because we go so far as mercy to say that God doesn't give us what we deserve, but we don't take the extra step to say that God actually, through Jesus Christ, gives us what we don't. 
Which is why I think Peter says, whatever your hope for the time of your exile is, pick it up and put it on grace because in that moment, you will become aware of what you have already been given that you do not deserve. Can I ask you a personal question? How has God given you grace? Now before you give the right, all-time, 100% correct church answer of Jesus Christ, I want you to pause for just a minute and I want you to think apart from the overwhelming, overarching salvation that's given to us by Jesus Christ, how has God been gracious to you? Look around the room. How has He given you grace? We all have different circumstances. We're all going through different things. We all have different emotions and backgrounds. But one thing that unites us all is we've all been given grace. There's not a person that's watching this that has not been given grace by God. How's God given you grace? What's he given you that you do not deserve? Look around. There is grace in your living room right now. There is grace on your computer screen right now. What happens when you take your hope and you set your mind and your hope on grace is that you remind yourself that though challenges exist, God is still giving us what we do not deserve. Though we are experiencing social distancing and we all want to vomit because of it, God is still gracious. He is still giving us things that we do not deserve. And no circumstance that has ever existed throughout time changes the fact that God gives grace in multiplied ways. Sometimes to really endure the present moment, the best tool that we have at our disposal is to pause, take a breath, and remind yourself of the grace that God has already given. Isn't it awfully easy to like be in your living room right now in a sea of grace and just be focused on the grace that you want that you don't have? <laughs> Isn't it awfully easy to live regardless of what your circumstance is right now, regardless of what your circumstance is right now, to live in a sea of overwhelming grace and to say, God, I want more and to be solely consumed with what you don't have rather than mindful of what you do. Peter knows what he's doing. Take your hope, pick it up, own it, set it on grace. <laughs> because you will remind yourself of how good God is is. He's good. God is good. He's as good today as he was six weeks ago, as he was 60 years ago, or 600 years ago. God is good. And taking your hope and setting it on grace is preaching to yourself the goodness of God. There is no dark night of the soul that believers experience and disciples of Jesus experience where they still don't have reason to say, thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you for giving me what I don't deserve. This isn't just true for this time. It's true for all times. Because it's so easy to live the kind of faith, if that's the right way to say it, where we're just constantly grateful for God, 
not giving us what we do. God, thank you for Jesus. You saved me from an eternal punishment. I'm thankful for that. Now let me get about my business. Rather than living a life of grace, where we embrace the multitude of gifts that God continues to give the ways that God paints His own good presence in a landscape in our life. One of the greatest apologetics we have, one of the greatest defenses that we have, one of the greatest testimonies that we have as believers of Jesus Christ at all times, but particularly in this time, is hope. Because based on God's promise... I know the future will not look like it does today. <laughs> and folks that don't have hope, folks that don't know Jesus say, they start scratching their head and thinking, what are they talking about? It's the greatest apologetic that we have. Hope set on grace. How can you show God honor in the conversations that you have this week? You know what hope does? Hope honors God. Because when believers hope, they proclaim that God has power in the present and in the future. How can you use the conversations that you're a part of this week to point to the future where you trust the promises of God and the grace of that God has given. What happens when we set our hope on grace is we realize that just the way it is still offers grace and the way that it will be, regardless of what it looks like, still offers us grace. Because hope, catch this, hope, biblical hope, is not wishful thinking. Biblical hope says there is a present and there is a future reality where God's promises will always be fulfilled. Regardless of the circumstance that we see, God's promise will always be fulfilled. What's the difference in hope and wishful thinking? What's the difference between hope and daydreaming? What's the difference between hope and some unrealistic utopia? Biblical hope is demonstrated when believers in Jesus say, regardless of what it is, God is in control. I'm going to take my hope up and I'm going to put it on the grace of God because He is always good and He will always give me what I do not deserve. Set hope on grace. Look at the second thing that Peter says. Prepare your minds through obedience. He says, prepare your minds through hope. Prepare your minds through obedience. Look at how he continues. 14th verse, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Peter says, take your hope, set it on grace and start living like it was a reality today. That's what he says. Peter says, bless the God and Father of your Lord Jesus Christ. Place your future, set your hope on the grace that has been poured out on you and be like obedient children to your Father. Be holy, for I am holy. The text could read, be children of obedience. Now maybe if you're reading that for the first time or if you're reading it for the first time in a long time, that sounds like a standard that we can't hit. And the reason that it sounds like a standard we can't hit is because we can't hit it. To be holy the way that God is holy isn't possible. My righteousness is not going to rise to the level of God's own 
holiness. Now, this is why it is so important to always read the Bible in context as much as we can, because it's possible and also incredibly easy to cherry pick verse 14 and 15 out of the text and say, you go be holy. And subsequently, if you're not, you're not going to be saved. Obedience leads to your salvation. Obedience leads to your grace. And we've got thousands of years of Christian doctrine that preaches that message. Now, here's the disadvantage that the American audience has is because we live in a consumeristic culture, because we do experience capitalism in every imaginable way in our country as an economic system. We take that economic system and we superimpose it on the Bible. So if I want salvation from God, I've got to give him or pay him through my faithfulness, righteousness, and obedience and holiness. The only problem with that is I'm never going to be holy enough. And what it can create is this vicious cycle where I try to be holy out of my own might and my own power only to realize a very short time later I can never be holy enough. So I, go frust- I grow frustrated with myself and with my father. And so either I quit or I try working harder only to grow my level of frustration and dissatisfaction with faith. Let me tell you, it's not true. Let me just be really, really, really clear. If my level of worth corresponds to my level of holiness, then I will never be worth much because I'm never going to be holy enough. And if that's true, what in the world is Peter suggesting? We were taught growing up, I was taught growing up, and I'm assuming a lot of you were taught growing up, that there's this staircase, this stair step to how we get to God. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, only to find out sometime later that there was this sixth step added, live faithfully. Now, I may get some emails about this this week, but but let me just say, (laughs) Revelation 2.10, live faithfully unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life, is taken way out of context. And what happens when we say you've got to be faithful in order to be saved is we create this yo-yo effect of salvation where when my life looks just like I want it to look, I feel saved. And when my life doesn't look like I want it to look, then I'm not saved. Then I go up and down and up and down. And I better get that prayer in right before I go to sleep because I don't know what's going to happen. Verse 14 and 15 come after verse 13 where Peter says, set your hope on grace. Set your hope on how God has already saved you. Let your obedience be a response to what God has already given you. The trouble with faithfulness as a way to salvation is I'm never going to be faithful enough. I'm always going to make mistakes. I'm never going to be perfectly righteous before God. And even when I feel saved, I create law. And holiness becomes a list of things that I don't do so that I can maintain my salvation. Let me ask ask you a question. Is salvation and grace built on human obedience? Is that the message that Peter really wants to send to exiles in Asia Minor? You better be holy because if you're not, God's not going to save you. I don't want to minimize holiness. A lot of the rest of the letter, Peter says, live this way. Live in such a way that offers God glory. But Peter is very clear that your holiness isn't what gets you grace. Your grace is what leads to holiness. Take your hope 
set it on grace and live in such a way where the future comes to the present. Live in such a way where people say, you do have hope. You do have hope. Set your hope on what you have already been given that you did not earn, that you did not pay for, that you did not deserve because God is grace. And be like a child, an obedient child. Now, Peter, Peter throws the finisher down on earning salvation by saying in this text itself that grace will be brought to you. Be a child of obedience. Don't be disobedient. If you're disobedient, you represent and demonstrate. Maybe that you're not following the Lord. Be obedient. But trust God and His work for your salvation. If you're following Jesus right now, living for Him, living with Him, if He saved you, be confident that your hope is set on God's good grace and in response, live a life that honors Him. When you believe that, the gospel, the good news message of Jesus Christ, let me, let me, tell, you, let me tell you what happens. Let me tell you at least one thing that happens. Holiness becomes less, this is what I cannot do, this is what I should not do, this is what I should avoid, and becomes more, this is what I can do that would bring God honor. And I think that's what Peter has in mind when he says, be holy the way God is holy. God's holiness isn't seen in only the things he avoids. God's holiness is seen in the things he does. The services that He provides. The grace. The grace that He gives. When you trust God's grace and you live obediently out of grace, your obedience becomes less things to avoid and more things you can do. Don't settle for a life that only avoids. Settle for a life, live in a life that says something about God. That demonstrates God's own holiness in your exile right in the middle of your current circumstance, whatever it is, how can you do good and holy things that point to God's good presence? This is such a beautiful image that Peter gives his original audience and that Peter gives us. What do you want the future to look like? What's your hope for this time? Wrap your arms around that as much as you can. Pick it up. Put it on the goodness of God. Remind yourself how good He's been. And live in such a way that demonstrates that goodness. Now you talk about changing the world. And a lot of what Peter's going to say throughout the rest of this letter is how the world can change. Let me leave you with a challenge this week. Actually, I want to give you two challenges this week. And I want, I, want you to, I want you to go with me here. What grace has the Lord given you? What grace is the Lord giving you right now? Would you write that down? Would you list that out? 
How has God given you something that you do not deserve? What has God given you that you do not deserve? Would you write that out and would you share that with us? Would you send that in an email to our church office? Would you post that on our social media platforms? Would you say, this is the grace that God has given me? Let me challenge you to do it. You may be inclined to say, ah, well, no, I don't. don't." Would you please think about God's grace? That's the first challenge. Here's the second challenge. What one thing, one thing, one one thing can you do today or in the next several days that demonstrates God's good presence for someone? What can you do as a form of obedience that demonstrates God's grace? Would you share that with us? Would you take a picture of that and put that on our social media platform? Would you email that to our church office? Here's what I want to start. I want people to see in our community, I want people to see in Cookville, I want people to see all around our area and all over the place where people are watching this video, a group of people that bands together to say two things, God is still gracious and we can still do. If you would share that with us, we want to show the world what faith does. Let's let's pray together. Lord God, I pray that you would help us set our future and our faith and our hope on your good grace. Father, I pray that you would help us fully trust that you've saved us out of your goodness, not out of our own obedience are we saved, but because you're good and because you're faithful in ways that we could never be faithful. Father, because of that, I pray that we would live in such a way that honors you, that follows your word, that treats you holy and represents you as a way to point others to your grace. But God, I pray that we would get that in the right order so that we would do. Lord, prepare our minds through hope, and through obedience for the challenges that exist. We bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Be blessed this week.